We are going to start in uh, verse 1. And we're live all over the world right now. Wherever you're at, I'm so glad you're here with us. We had fog this morning in Southern California. And hey, Californians, we got, I got you a sweatshirt because it's going to get in the 50s here pretty soon. So Californians don't know how to act when there's a little mist in the air and it gets them down to 50. Like it's freezing. All right. Matthew 5 verse 1. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, circle peacemakers, that's where we're going today. For they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Wow, circle persecuted. For righteousness sake, underline righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you, circle revile you, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And you know, it, it reminds me, before we get going, I forgot to show you the video. Um, those of you that have not seen, uh, when we did our dedication service, the reason we're celebrating a year is because um, we asked God to bless this place a year ago. We asked God we'd do a miracle here. And God has made us one of the fastest growing families in the world because lives are changing here through the gospel. And so a year ago, we had a ceremony where we brought rocks in. Um, I did a sermon at the other campus uh, on the book of Exodus. And in the story of the Exodus, where, they're, where they left slavery, they're going to enter the promised land. They're going to enter their new home. They, they brought 12 rocks out of the Jordan River and they stacked them up. And it was a reminder, an eternal reminder for all the people of Israel that God had been faithful to them. And after that sermon, I said, I'm going to put these rocks in my office. And when God leads us to our new home, I'm going to put them in the stage. And I hung onto those stinking rocks for almost seven years. Seven years, those things sat in my office on the carpet. And I just kept praying to Jesus, when are we going? When are we going? When are we going? And God, we looked at about 30 places around our valley and beyond. And God closed every door and then he gave us the best. And he put an in and out in our stinking parking lot. Praise God. Like you're the most blessed of all people in the world. So I'm gonna actually show you that video. The reason we're celebrating our one year anniversary. And uh, cause many of you didn't see it. You didn't even know. And I wanna, I wanna show it to you here. So here's what happened there a year ago. People still in this church from the seventies and eighties that when they were struggling to keep the lights on, people hung in there and they didn't leave. And, and when it, the bank was going to foreclose on that property. They were like, they kept on pushing through. So what you're seeing right now is the faithfulness of men and women of God and families of God who have made this moment happen. And so, um, gentlemen, come on up. <laughs> the reason I showed you that video is those rocks the rocks of God's promise are under my feet every Sunday I preach. And not only that, but uh, we collected about 1,200 prayers on three by five cards from the people that were part of the church. And, um, and we collected them all and I put them in a box and they are under this stage on top of those rocks. And then I took one of my Bibles that I preached at 
uh, in Moraga and I put that under the stage. So literally every time you see me on the stage, I'm standing on the rocks of God's promise. I'm standing on the prayers of God's people that made this place happen. And I'm standing on the word of God. So listen, hey, you are part of a miracle. You're part of a miracle. Even if this is your first Sunday here, you're part of a miracle. And I want you to know that every time I take this stage, that that's the reality that's underneath me as I teach you. So moving on, if you have your notes, pull them out. It should be inside your bulletin if you came on campus. Hey, how are my fireplace people? Praise God. Love my people. Hey, here it is. I'm going to teach you how to have peace in your life. Jesus says one of the most amazing things in, the, in these Beatitudes. Beatitudes means blessed. That's why Jesus says blessed all the time. And the, one of the main aspects of living for God, I'm going to teach you one of the most difficult, but yet most rewarding aspects of being a Christian in the world. And that's how to be at peace. And it's going to surprise you. because Some of you are not going to understand the kind of peace I'm talking about. You've been, some of us have never been taught this. And some of us are actually taught wrong in churches before. So actually, let's walk through this. If you have your notes, pull them out. Number one is this. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Being ruled by Rome. So this is 2,000 years ago when Jesus spoke these words in Matthew 5. Being ruled by Rome. Jesus' Jewish audience experienced social prejudice and political injustice. So here we go. Everybody walk with me. 2,000 years ago, Jesus speaking to thousands of people. He's a rock star. Everybody wants a piece of Jesus. When he opens his mouth, people are like, I can't believe when he speaks, I, I sense God. And, and they've, they've heard Greek orders and Roman orders, but when Jesus speaks, it's like, Dude, there's nobody like this guy. Like, there's a lot of great guys. There's no one like him. He's, he's a standalone. So there's thousands of people gathered on this hillside. The Jews are ruled by Rome. Rome doesn't care about them. They're an irritant to Rome. The only reason they care about the Jews is because they want their land. Because the Israel is a really thin piece by the Mediterranean Sea that controls trade from north and south. So they want that. Couldn't care less about the people. So I'm a Jew in the first century. Um... I know people are prejudiced against me every day because of my ethnicity or my skin color or how I act or how I dress as a Jew. Romans don't care about me. They just want me to behave. So that irritates me. So I'm, I'm angry at the government that's over me and it irritates me every day. I'm prejudiced against if I have a, if I have a, a problem with another person, the judicial system isn't going to take care of me. They don't care about me. They don't care about my case. They don't care about anything. So I live in this world of like political and governmental angst and anger. And now Jesus has this huge crowd. He's influencing thousands. He has a moment. There's a moment where he's sitting on the hillside as a Jew. And he could, could have said this. Hey, hey, everybody, you irritated about the government? Hey, you irritated about our governor? Feeling a little agitated about the people ruling you? Guess what? I have the answer. You know what we're going to do? We're going to go march on Rome. We're going to go to Caesar. We're going to tell him how we feel. And if we have to do a little violence here and there, well, you know what? What has to happen? You want people to pay attention? Sometimes you got to give them a smack. That's what we're going to go do. And you know what? If somebody has to die once in a while, eh, that's the price of freedom. You guys irritated? Everybody, everybody getting fired up? Because I'm going to lead us there. Ready? We're going to go march. We're going we're to do demonstrations. We're going to stand up in our communities. We're going to start yelling and screaming. And guess what? You want to know something? There was killers in that crowd. There was a small contingent of men called Sakari in the first century. And Sakari had about six to seven inch knives that they would hide inside their waistband, inside their cloak. And with the Sakari, the Sakari were the first century terrorists. And the difference was that they didn't look any different than the people. It was kind of like when we went to Vietnam or, you know, when you're in Iran or Iraq, you don't really know who is there to try to kill you or somebody just normal, just walking normal as a regular person. So that, so they were the guerrilla warfare of the first century. And what they would do is this. When there was a big crowd together and uh, they were walking through the crowd, they'd see a Roman dressed in, you know, the red, or dressed like a Roman. 
And they'd walk up and pull this knife out and they walk up behind them and slit their throat and, and fall back into the, the crowd. And that Roman would fall down on the ground and just start bleeding out in the crowd. And the crowd that's majorly Jewish would go, sucks for you. There's one that just had to die because we're going to get some attention now. Guess what? Those people were in the crowd. Jesus could have easily said, everybody ready to go? And there would have been men there like, I got you, Jesus. That's literally what I've been waiting for. Let's go overthrow this government. Let's go stand up for ourselves. I'm tired of getting prejudiced against. I'm tired of people being bigoted against me because of who I am. It's time to do something. It's time to stand up. You know what Jesus does? He goes, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus, that's the lamest thing I've ever heard. Watch, it might, be, it might be something different than you think. Let's look at it. Jesus told his followers, um, but instead of preaching, marching or quarreling or fighting for their rights, anybody fight for their rights? We live in a culture of like obsessed with your rights. I have rights. We're so obsessed with our rights that we force other people to tell us what we want to hear. I, I have pronouns I want you to tell me. Like we're so obsessed with our rights, we force other people to tell us something even if it's not true. So our culture is immersed and obsessed with saying, I have rights and I'm going to force you to tell me what I want to hear. For many of us, we want to fight for our right to party. Where's my 80s babies? Okay. If you don't know, youngsters, just Google BC Boys. Okay. I'm not saying that's godly. I'm just saying that's the reality. Ready? Everybody wants to, their rights. You know what Jesus says? When you enter the kingdom of heaven, when you enter the kingdom of God, when you become a child of God, you have different rights. There's a different strategy to serving God. Here we go. Believers are to be peacemakers instead of chaos creators. Woo, look at it. Matthew 5. Look at your Bible, Matthew 5, 9. I told you to circle peacemakers. If you have your Bible, I want you to write, I have it in your notes there. I want you to write this. A person who pacifies problems. This is going to be different than the peacemaker you've ever heard. So watch. Peacemaker doesn't mean I'm passive. Peace, look, watch me. Literally, peacemaker in the Greek means I proactively promote peace wherever I go. It's going to be different. I had a professor and a pastor and some friends when I was in college that said, Jesus is a pacifist. Like, it's right there. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. How can you go to war and be a peacemaker? You can't. So Jesus is a pacifist. And I thought, well, considering he never told one person that was in the military to leave the military if they were going to be a Christian, and he's coming back as a warrior to destroy the nations of the world. And most of the Old Testament's all God telling him to go to war against people that are, are attacking them. I can't, I can't make that work. And then I realized peacemaker isn't, I'm passive and I, I, I won't join the army. What it means is this, when you, when you interpersonally interact with someone, you bring peace to the interaction rather than relational chaos. All of Jesus' blessednesses here are how to interact interpersonally. Somebody slaps you on the cheek, give them the other cheek. It's how, I want peace between the two of us. It's not about nations going to war or you being part of the military. Because God upholds all military action as long as it moves toward uh, correcting evil in the world. So I, I asked the people like, do you lock your door, bro? Yeah, of course I lock my door. I thought you were a pacifist. Well, what does that have to do with being a pacifist? Well, then you should just let people come in your house because you're not going to stop them. Right? You're not going to get into a scuffle. You know, let, why don't you just open, leave the door open so people can walk in your house or steal your stuff or rape your wife or kill you because you're not going to do nothing. And you go, well, that's kind of, I, I wouldn't do that. Right, because you that's dumb. You'd stand up, right, against evil the way we did for like Germany in World War II. They're literally exterminating people and other nations had to step in to stop it. They would have rolled right over all of Europe 
if nobody had stepped in. Just killing people. So watch, sometimes nations, I'm not saying it, it always is, but sometimes nations have to go to war against nations to stop evil from happening. And you have to stop evil in your own life. And that isn't you not being a peacemaker. That's you saying, I'm going to stop evil so there can be peace. Sometimes you go to war to keep, to make peace happen when there's chaos. You are the peace bringer. And sometimes it has to be stopping somebody from doing evil because they're continuing to make chaos. So Jesus' words here are this. Blessed are you when you are the peacemaker. Blessed are you when you're the wife and you're really irritated at your husband, which I know never happens at the orchard, but if you ever run into some woman that's irritated at her husband because he's late or something else, ready? You as a woman of God have to say, am I being a woman of peace in this marriage? Or am I just always irritated and cold shoulders and angry and whatever? It hurts my marriage, hurts my relationship with my kids because I'm mad at dad all the time. Are you a woman of peace? In your relationships, are you a woman that brings peace to the table or do you just bring relational chaos? Emotional angst? Or do you, are you the woman that brings peace? Husbands, stop being stupid. Are you a man that brings peace into your marriage? Or do you create chaos for your wife? You create insecurity for her because of how you spend your money. And she creates anxiety for her because you're, you're not managing the house money well. So are, are you a man that's creating peace in your marriage, creating peace in your home, creating peace at your job, creating peace on the 15? Please merge in front. Right? That's, what, that's what Jesus means. He doesn't mean you never fight because sometimes fighting gets to peace, brings peace about if there's evil. But this, this is the issue. Are you interpersonally a person that, that brings peace to every relationship? Or are you the person that brings some kind of drama? Angel mama. Are you drama maker or are you a peace bringer? That's what Jesus is saying here. It says this, this isn't I'm passive. I just stand in the background and hope for the best. Jesus is not a pacifist. He's a peacemaker, which peacemaker is in the Greek is literally means it's proactive peace. Wherever I go, I bring peace to you. It's not passive peace. Let's hope, hope nobody gets hurt. It's proactive peace. Everywhere I go, I bring peace. I don't bring chaos. I don't bring drama. That's what it means to be a Christian because the world's full of chaos and drama. And Jesus shines through you when you're not like that. It'll keep your marriage together. It'll keep your home together. You'll keep a job. You won't get shot on the freeway. I just saved some of your lives. Because some of you road ragers out there, you need to be a peace bringer, not a peace bringer. I just made that up. That was nice. Hey, the other, the other services didn't even get that. Wow. All right, move it on. Here we go. Here we go. This is going to be a huge piece to this piece about peace. So listen, this is different now. I just told you, Jesus isn't pacifist. He is a peace bringer, which is proactive, not passive, okay? Here's the other side of peace. Did Jesus ever feel stress and a lack of peace physically or emotionally? He actually did. This is gonna blow your mind. I'm gonna try to take away some of the Christian guilt you might feel for feeling anxious once in a while or feeling stressed out. Because I'm going to give you a different version of peace than the kind of peace Jesus is talking about. Here we go. This is going to surprise you because you've never thought about this or you were taught poorly. Here we go. Believers should make peace, not make problems. Believers should make peace, not make problems. Jesus didn't say, you know what the problem with our lives is? Is we need to get rid of our governor. We need to get rid of our president. We need to get rid of Congress. But like if I was running the ship, everything would be awesome. Guess what? You know what you need to do? You need to pray for our governor that he finds Jesus and starts making better decisions rather than screaming about stuff that'll never change, okay? You need to start praying for our president that he's gonna be a man of God and then he'll make better decisions. So if you don't like what you're seeing, okay. I'm not saying I like anything either. What I am saying is the way forward for Jesus isn't politics first or my anger first or everything I just wanna vent about online. It's Jesus first. And then Jesus is the one that gives clarity to everything else in my life. 
Because I'm a peace bringer, not a chaos creator. Now, here we go. Because that's true, how can I live my life in peace? Personally, here it is. Jesus didn't always feel emotional or physical calm like when he went to the cross, but he always had spiritual and mental peace knowing he was doing God's will. Woo! I'm going to free you from a lot of junk. Here we go. Jesus didn't have peace physically or emotionally every day of his life. And that surprises us because we're like, I thought Jesus just kind of floated through life. <laughs> Untouched by me. Please don't touch me. I'm Jesus. I have no problems. I'm God. I just float through life. I have this little halo. Nobody touches me. Nobody talks to me. I have no drama. It's amazing. Dude, have you read the Bible? He has drama with his disciples. He has drama with people in the crowd. He has drama with the religious leaders that want to kill him. Jesus, Jesus' life is packed with drama. Not that he created, other people bring it to him. So guess what? In the Garden of Gethsemane, I have it in your notes there. In the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, which we were at, we will go there on the trip. If you come with me, I'll teach you right at the Garden of Gethsemane where this actually happened. He, he, he starts to break down to his father, crying out to God, if there's any way this cup can pass for me, I don't have to go to the cross. And it says, he started to sweat drops of blood. And that's an extreme form of stress where you're under so much stress and, and anxiety, you're, the blood vessels start to, to pop. And as the, you know, when you sweat, when you're just really stressed out or you're really anxious, it's the blood actually comes out with the sweat, which is an extreme form of anxiety, an extreme form of stress. So it's not the case. Jesus didn't feel the same stress and anxiety you feel in life. What is true though, is that he always trusted God and he knew God would get his back. And so he could always live in peace spiritually and mentally knowing he's doing the will of God. And if you're doing the will of God, God's got your back. Even if you have to go through times of stress, which you will, there are going to be days you wish you were dead. There are going to be days you don't want to live another day. Ready? Those days are coming if they're not here yet. Let me, let me encourage you into the future. Let me speak into your future. In the days those happen, the days those, those times happen, which they will, financial stress, bad health, things go bad. Those are days are coming. In those moments go, God, I want to live in peace. I trust you. I want to live in peace. Ready? Your emotional state, you will never live in calm every day of your life, but you can live in peace. How is that? I can have relational drama, financial drama, health drama, but if I've got Jesus and I know I'm following God, God gives me interior peace so that I can always bring peace everywhere I go. Even if the storm surrounds me, I'm in peace in the middle of the storm. That's what it means to live in peace. It doesn't mean you won't have stress. It doesn't mean you won't have anxiety. But it does mean if you, know, if you know you're walking with God, God goes with you. And you can always live in peace knowing God has your back. Here's our, here's our principle. You won't always feel peace with situations, but you can face situations with peace. That literally is your whole life right there. Look at it. Because it's impossible to, to go through your whole life living in emotional calm. You can't. You're going to wake up some days. You're going to feel horrible. There's going to be drama with your, with your siblings. There's just drama in the world. We're drama creatures. But what's the, what's the hope? I can face any situation with peace if I know Jesus is with me. I won't always feel calm, but I can always feel peace. Jesus preached for personal and relational peace not military or judicial peace. So, hey, look at me. Everybody, look at me. Don't tap out. I know, it's, I know it's late. Drink a Red Bull. Come with me. Ready? Here's what I'm saying about, again, what I just got to say about pacifism. Jesus isn't saying it's about nations and judicial system. So, in other words, you murder people and you get sentenced to death. You rightly deserve to die. Justice is being served. You murdered people. And if, it's, if that's what our justice system has decided, um, you're, not, you're not being persecuted because you murdered somebody and that's the end of our judicial system, if that's what is decided. Same thing with countries. When countries go to war and have to stop somebody, if, if you're in the war, you're in the army or military or whatever, um, you're called by our nation to go do that thing. And so you do that. You, you bring peace to the people you're around because it's an interpersonal peace situation. But 
God is the one who holds the rulers and kings and presidents accountable for what they do uh, in the world. And so you just be the best light you can, whatever God has called you to. And so God will keep you in perfect peace if you are focused on him. Enduring difficulty strengthens your emotional state so you can respond in peace rather than in pieces. <laughs> Some of you guys aren't even reading my notes. That's really lame because I thought that was pretty good. Hey, you know what? When you're emotionally weak, everybody look at me. When you're emotionally weak, this is what happens. Is the minute there's drama in your life, you just start spinning out. I want to die. I'm going to go back on taking those pills. I'm going to start drinking again. I'm going to do whatever. And when, when you're emotionally weak, you go to crutches. I need this thing. I got a bad, I'm, I'm emotionally in stress. So I'm going back to porn or I'm going to go find a relationship or whatever. Okay. So if you don't have strength emotionally to face what difficulty is coming to you, you're going to find a crutch to help you along either to numb the pain or to forget the pain or to set the pain aside for a second. So why does God leave pain in our life? If God is a God of peace, why don't I feel peace in these particular moments? Because God wants you to grow up emotionally. In the same way that you need to work your muscles like these massive guns to, to be worked out, what's true physically is also true emotionally. Many of us, though, we've been told our whole lives, like, oh, you're a victim. Oh, things are bad. I know things are horrible, blah, blah, blah. Listen, Jesus could have said that to his own people. They were the victims, and it was legit. He could have gone, everybody's the victim here. Everybody's having a bad time. I feel you. I'm one of you. Let's, let's all just kind of, let's mope and mourn and cry about it. Let's have a group-like hug. No, Jesus doesn't do that. He goes, man, blessed are the peacemakers. Because you have the strength to be at peace, even when there's chaos around you. Which means that even when you have emotional difficulty, give it to Jesus. Jesus, in this moment, I don't feel at peace, but I give it to you. Here's the way you, here's the way you live in peace. Look at me. Here's the way you live in peace. Tomorrow morning, when you get up, the very first conscious thought should be, God, let me be a peacemaker today. Let me be a peacemaker to my husband. I'm kind of angry at him for what happened last night, but I'm going to be a wife of peace. I'm kind of angry at my wife because of uh, the way she speaks to me and is disrespectful and that I'm, I live in anger to more, toward my wife. Nope, I'm gonna live in peace toward my wife. I'm gonna love her rather than be angry at her. I'm angry at my kids because they exist, but I'm still, gonna, I'm still gonna love my kids, okay? It's one of those things. You, listen to me. The way you get emotionally strong is you have to choose to, to go with what's true rather than what you feel because what you feel will come and go, but what's true exists forever and that includes walking with God. So you become emotionally strong. Yeah, things are, things are not great, but man, God is strong in me. Emotionally, all day I say, let me be a man of peace. Let me be a man of peace. When I'm merging on the freeway, let me be a man of peace today. It's literally that, that, that applicable. Your whole life will change when you become a person of peace. Let me tell you how it works out in my life. Literally after the first service today, I'm in my office getting ready for the second service. My wife comes back there and she comes in. She goes, wow, that was pretty good. He goes, you know what? I just, I've, I'm vowing to you this week that I'm going to be a wife of peace. And I said to her, I'm, I'm vowing to you this week I'm going to be a husband of peace. So I, I literally want you to know I apply these things in real time just the way you do. But if you... <laughs> way to not be a hypocrite, pastor! <laughs> but the point I'm making is this. It's literally like that. It isn't like, oh, that was a nice ethereal thing I just heard. No, man, practice it. Your whole life will be different. Don't be a person of drama. Don't be a chaos creator. Be a peacemaker. So I've hammered that point over and over to number two. Here we go. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. As the gospel message is offensive to people's pride, Jesus knew it would not be received well by everyone, especially those in power. So when we talk about the gospel, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying the sin in your life needs to be forgiven. And that's offensive to a lot of us because we're like, I'm a pretty good person. I'm better than you or that person or that woman over there. Like, I don't need to be forgiven for anything. Like, they're the ones that need to be forgiven for anything. So we have a, we have a self-righteous view of ourselves. When we're confronted with the gospel, no, you need to change, man. You're literally going to hell because you hate God. Like, I don't hate God. Me and God, we're bros. You're not bros if your sins aren't forgiven. You need Jesus. 
You need a perfect man to die for your sinful self so that you can be a child of God. Many of us don't want that message. And many people didn't want it back in Jesus' day. It offended people. So what they decided to do was rather than accept it, they would persecute the people who were saying that message. And that's what Jesus is saying here. While many will hear and respond to the gospel, like we're seeing at our church, like thousands of people are responding to the true gospel here. Some people will not only reject what they hear, but also physically persecute believers for doing God's work. Hey, I told you to uh, circle it in your Bible. Look at verse 10, Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. I told you to circle persecuted. In your Bible, next to that word persecuted, write uh, hunter. What that, what that Greek word means, it doesn't mean persecuted like, oh, I got blocked on you know, Facebook by a friend. I feel persecuted. It means literally like a hunter going after prey. It means like somebody kicking your door down going, renounce Jesus or I'm going to kill you now. And you having to make the choice, do I go back on Jesus to save my own skin or do I die and go see Jesus? Like it's that choice here. This is like, it means Persecuted is the Greek word that means a hunter going after prey. It's what happens in most countries today. Did you know today when we met, we meet in this sweet building and we're free. I can, I'm up on a jumbo screen. I got a sweet sound system and I just put the gospel out there. In most parts of the world, um, you can't just speak the gospel like this. They have to go up into attics and hide and somebody gets to read a little piece of the Bible. Some people are literally underground or in a cave and the little church meets together of six people and they read the Bible by candlelight and they have to tear the Bible up and they give it to different people in the church. So if one person gets arrested, the whole Bible doesn't get taken. So do you know that more people have died for the sake of Christ in the last hundred years than the first 1900 combined? Which surprises us because we're like, I feel no persecution like that. Nobody hunts me. But for most of the world, they're, they, they're in governments that won't even let them talk about God. So it literally costs them sometimes their lives, their jobs. Parents are split up. One woman goes over here. A man gets thrown in prison. And you have, a woman's forced to marry another guy. It's, it's like that. So when Jesus talks about blessed are the persecuted, blessed are those who are hunted because of you want to do the right thing for Jesus. And we, we're not there yet. We might be at some point. But just be aware, Jesus is saying, blessed are you. If you have to die for the sake of the gospel, blessed are you because you will see God. Christians who act foolish or stand for what God doesn't care about aren't being oppressed, but are rightly ridiculed for stupidity. So let me help you with this. Sometimes I'll get this like, hey, you know, I posted that thing about being a Republican and uh, a bunch of people attacked me in the comment section. I feel persecuted for the gospel. I put that thing about being a Democrat. And I'm trying to get people to come to democracy. And all of a sudden people like we're saying I'm a loser. I feel so oppressed for Jesus. I'm a naked tree hugging independent. And I want people to join my independence party. But people are saying I'm a weird cult. And now I feel oppressed. Stop. Stop. You're not oppressed for the gospel. You're oppressed because you're dumb. And Jesus just goes, you're dumb. You, you, deserve, you deserve people to speak that way about you. You're being dumb. Stop being dumb and do Jesus stuff. If you're persecuted for Jesus stuff, okay, that's a different category. But don't blame everything on, you know, I'm getting persecuted for Jesus when you just really made a dumb post on Facebook. I move on. Number three, here we go. Ready? Number one, blessed are the peacemakers. I'm going to hammer this yet again. Be a person of peace this week. Stop posting stuff that, that isn't about Jesus. I know you hate the governor. I know you hate the president. Okay. I know you hate people. I don't care about any of that. I care. Do you love Jesus? People, people reading that many of us, if I was to look at your Facebook feed or whatever, there's not one thing about Jesus on it, but there's a bunch of other stuff. Listen, it's always Jesus first because Jesus is the Prince of peace. I should be a person of peace because I know the Prince of peace. Number two, blessed are those persecuted for righteousness. If you have to die for the gospel, go die. If you have to die for the gospel, go die. And I'll see you on the other side. Or maybe you will see me. Either way, the gospel is worth your, worth your life. 
Because a life without Jesus has no value. Lastly, number three, blessed are those reviled for Jesus. This actually does apply to you and me. Most people will not have physical violence or painful persecution happen to them. Like I got done talking about in point two. But nearly all of us will be reviled at some point. So look at it. Verse 11, it says, I told you circle revile. Uh, Right next to it, mock or insult. So this is when people mock you or insult you. And you don't get invited to the parties that you used to get invited to because everybody's drinking or having sex or doing whatever. And you go, dude, I used to be about that life. I don't want to do that anymore. And then people go, bro, are we going to Vegas or not? Are you guys going to go to strip clubs? Of course we are, dude. We've been doing that for like two, two decades. Now I'm not about that life anymore. What's wrong with you? Are you stupid? Now I'm following Jesus now and I'm not going to do that anymore, man. I wasted enough of my money and life on that. I'm not doing that anymore. That's the old me. That's the dead me. That's not even the me that I even think I am anymore. Listen, you're going to lose friends. You will legitimately be blocked. You'll legitimately get comments in your Facebook feed about how I don't want to hear about Jesus anymore. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Blessed are those when people revile you, when they insult you, when they call you a loser, and you lose your friends. Some of you guys are going to lose your wife because you just became a Christian here at the orchard. And your wife's like, dude, I, I'm not about that life. I don't want to follow Jesus. I want to, I want to, I'm 53 years old, but I want to live like I'm 22 and dress like it. And like, well, I don't, I don't want to live that way anymore, man. I'm, I'm tired of swinging. I'm done. I'm done with that sinful way of life, man. I want to, and your wife's going to be like, well, if that's, your, that's the way you're living, I'm out. And some of you guys, your wife is going to divorce you because you want to love Jesus. And some of you guys are going to lose husbands, ladies, because you're like, you just found Jesus here and you got to watch out living for Jesus. Your husband wants to live the old way. And he goes, well, if this is the way you're going to live, man, I don't want a wife like that. Blessed are you when people revile you and hate you because of my name. As words are easy to say and can hurt the most for the longest amount of time because they go into our souls, Jesus told believers to remember who they are in God's mind and not from someone else's mouth. Hey, let me encourage you and I'm done. Look at me. Be encouraged. God loves you. God's got you. God is for you. Don't let people and the crap and the things they say. Kids, don't use that word if mom and dad said that's a bad word. But Pastor Jim said it. And the things people say that are bad. Okay? Don't let that happen. Why? Because you're a child of the king. You're a daughter of the king. So stand up and be a man and woman of God. I close with this principle. I love this. This is the best part. I waited to the end. Only God can turn trash talk into gold. Bam! Eat it. When I wrote that in here, I'm like, dude, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Hey, only God can turn trash talk into gold for you. Only God can bring good out of evil that people want to bring into your life. Only God can do that. So why wouldn't you follow God? Because hard times will come, but the God who, who loves you will walk you through those hard times.